everyone. My name is Lana Ruck, and I'm a dual PhD candidate in the Cognitive Science Program and Anthropology Department at Indiana University in the States. I'm very nervous about time, so we're going to dive right in. Um, my research is on handedness, and about a decade ago, as an undergraduate student, I asked when and why did right handedness become so common, not knowing that we didn't know the answer and that it would lead me on a garden path of just crazy cognitive evolution type stuff. Um, so right hand predominance, which is about 85% of modern humans today, um, is unique to our species. Um, individual apes do have hand preference, especially those in captivity, um, but it's randomly distributed between right and left 50-50, um, debated. Um, but that suggests that the population pressure, like the split from 50-50 to an almost 90-10 population happened after our lineage split from the other hominids. Um, hominids and individual hand preference is actually really, really interesting because it relates to other important and uniquely expanded capacities of our lineage. Um, and that includes tool use and language. Um, and so there's this idea in the literature from neuroscience and psychology that is over 150 years old, that these things are probably related on an individual basis because of how our brain is organized and how it's embedded in our body. Right, so the left hemisphere of your brain controls the right half of your body and vice versa. This is very old, like older than mammals. Um, but something unique about our species is this relationship between tool use, language, visual spatial attention, um, and handedness. And so from a theoretical perspective, this is really, really interesting for archaeologists because we're all super interested in like the origins of, not all of us, but if you're in this room, you're probably interested in the origins of language or the um, expansion of cognitive capacities in our species and things like that. And like brains don't fossilize. And the words that those brains made don't fossilize, right? You have no direct access to these types of things, cognitive decisions in general. Um, but we work in implied proxies and these proxy relationships. And the idea is if their brains didn't fossilize and their words didn't fossilize, but we know that individual hand preference is related to at least the hemispheric dominance for those types of things, well, what if evidence of handedness did fossilize? Then the idea is we could go through time and track when it was like 50-50 distributed between right and left-handers to maybe something like 60-40, 70-10, 80-20, up to today, right? And you would want to know if that happened very quickly or slowly. Did it happen in localized population groups? Did it happen everywhere? What was the general selection story for that scenario? And then you would be able to use that as a proxy for at least when this pattern of hemispheric specialization in the brain, this task division in the brain, would have evolved. So that's the like big theoretical A to B to C to D all the way to Z type idea. Um, and I wrote a paper about that in 2014. I'm just going to reference papers for time's sake. So look me up. I'm out there. Um, there are significant pragmatic problems with this type of theory, as there are in our field in general. Um, Problem number one is that we can't currently tell when handedness became more common, specifically right-handers, using archaeological methods. I wrote on this a lot. My specific area of study is stone tools. Can you tell in lithic debitage and the actual products whether the napper was right or left-handed? That's not even considering how do you detect number of nappers at a site, what the population size was. Those methods, the currently published ones, they're not working. Okay, So that's problem number one. We don't really know how to use archaeology to track handedness other than like paired long bones, which are rare. Um, problem number two. Oh, hey, I switched my slide order. OK, fine. Um, I think we could solve this problem using really labor intensive new age archaeological methods, right? You could, if you wanted to, scan a million flakes with a 3D scanner, spend your life doing that, plug it into a machine learning algorithm, tell that this is right and left handed, and use experimental archaeology to like build a working ground based model and blah, blah, blah. Lots of labor, right? There are so many other interesting things you could do with 3D scanning technology <laughs> that it's like, if we need to start from the ground up with the archaeological like handedness research, is that worth it? So my dissertation is a cost-benefit analysis of that kind of question. Like, and it really depends if handedness is valuable for tracking brain laterality and like origins of language-ready brains, things like that, then it's probably worth it to do that labor. If not, it's not worth it to do that labor. Scan flakes for another reason. OK, here is where we get to problem number two. Um, recent neuroarchaeal or neuroscience literature suggests that handedness actually isn't a good proxy for brain organization. So this implied proxy behavior we really care about 
The neuroscientists are like, nah, fam, that's not true. Um, and it's this idea, while left-handers are mirrored in their handedness, so they should be mirrored in their brain organization. That's what they're expecting. Then they go do a bunch of brain imaging studies, spend billions of dollars, like the UK Biobank, which has like 30,000 participants, and they find that left-handers have right-handed looking brains. Big problem. Here's where I start sounding like a conspiracy theorist. Billions of dollars on genetics, billions of dollars on um, the neuroimaging methods. Their measure of handedness is a 10 to 20 question survey. They ask you what hand you use to hold a spoon, hold a match, hold a fork, whatever, and that's your handedness. From the anthropological perspective, you can't ask an ape or a baby what its hand preference is using a survey. You have to watch their behaviors. And the neuroscientists are not doing this. So I'm like, okay, maybe problem number two is not actually a problem on our end. Maybe it's that neuroimagers are measuring handedness wrong, and then they're failing to find this proxy relationship. I've also written about that. Um, and I'm not the only one, thank the gods, the psychologists are also starting to realize, like, oh, maybe a question, like 10 questions, is not an accurate portrayal of how people use their bodies in the real world. Um, archaeologists are like, yeah, wow. OK, so enter my dissertation. The goal is basically to tighten up that inferential gap using empirical data. I want to evaluate whether handedness is a good proxy for a brain organization, specifically with tools and language and all these things. And I just call it hands, brains, tools, words. Let's look at it all as one system and see if that holds. OK, um, I am imaging modern day humans. And I plan to do 40, um, 20 lefties and 20 righties. And the first thing they do is they come fill out that survey that everybody's using, but then they also do other behavioral tasks. So they come in the lab and actually use their hands. This is a puzzle task. And I basically go through and code. And so does an undergraduate assistant. We check for inner reliability. Um, how often do they use their right and left hands in a naturalistic setting? They do a bunch of other naturalistic tasks. So we get several different measures of their hand preference, including the survey. Then on a separate day, they learn to expediently make mode one old one tools. Um, they are not language trained. They watch a video from a first person perspective of me reducing a couple cores. Um, I don't speak at all. The view they watch matches their reported handedness. So if it's a left hander, I left right image reverse the video and they watch it. And then they get three cores. Um, they're simply told bang this until you feel like you might injure yourself. And then at, at the end of the core exhaustion, I collect that into like core wise little things. So this is also implicitly creating one of those ground truthing data sets where I'll have flakes from left handers and flakes from right handers that I could, if I chose the labor to be worth it, 3D scan and try and detect handedness from debitage. Um, they only nap for an hour and I basically just want them to realize it's really hard and it's not very fun to do it, right? To gain an appreciation for the skill. <coughs> then they get in the fMRI scanner and they watch videos of tool making while there's concurrent eye tracking, that little blue dot you see is where the participant is looking at the time. They do a language task, a well-known language task for assessing brain laterality and a visual spatial tools uh, skills task. And I have two questions and because of time I'm going to go through them really quick. Can you tell which hemisphere is active for each task and are they related to each other? How does that relate to participant handedness, especially depending on which handedness measure you're using? Make sense? Okay, flying through some results here. I only have pilot data for uh, 15 people. And the way that all this works is by averaging. And so I'm not going to report statistics. I don't believe in reporting underpowered statistics. I'm just going to talk to you about some trends today. Um, one thing that we do in this literature is make a laterality index. And it's basically what's the difference between your right and left hand divided by the sum of those measures. And if it's really, really negative, that means your left hand bias, right brain bias. If it's really positive, that means your right hand bias, left brain bias. So like righty is positive 100, lefty is negative 100. Everybody in the real world, somewhere in between those things. And we make a laterality index for everything. Your handedness survey score, your puzzle task, your brain task, all those things. And then see if the laterality indices correlate with each other. Make sense? OK. Um, ba -ba 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 -ba. Um, this is like a graph of like the puzzle task plotted against the survey score. And red, or the red left-hand side of the graph is the left-handers, and the right-hand side in the blue, that tiny little line is right-handers. And like for the puzzle task, the more you use your right hand in that task, the more likely you are to have a very right-biased survey score. Sweet. That's what we want to see. We want to see handedness measures that actually agree with each other. Um, the puzzle task is kind of the only task that does that. Um, for my right-handers, which are on the far right side of the graphs there, there are interesting and tight relationships between these, these behavioral scores and their survey scores. 
for left-handers, like flat line, as flat as you can get. Um, this is a small sample, but I will say I'm working on a paper right now using human connectome project data, which is 1,200 subjects, and you see the exact same pattern, where left-handers are particularly mischaracterized by this survey. Okay, so if we're mischaracterizing left-handers especially, maybe they shouldn't have these reversed image left-hand brains because they're actually using their right hand upwards of 50% of the time when they do real tasks. Y'all live in a right-handed world. I'm super sorry. Um, in terms of the brain data, this gets even more wibbly. Brain imaging processing is all based on averaging, and some people will have brains that just like light up. They're consuming a lot of blood. They're really like... Urgh. And some people for the exact same task have tiny little localized clusters. There's a lot of variance that you have to deal with in this data, which is why neuroimagers exclude left-handers in the first place. They're doing variance reduction. Um, so I'm not going to report over um, statistics or like um, summary data for the brains just yet, um, but I will talk about these laterality indices again. This is what an ideal world graph should look like like for the language task and the visual spatial task, which are supposed to be in separate hemispheres. The idea is your handedness and your language dominance are in one hemisphere and they kind of force visual spatial attention to the other hemisphere. Lots of problems with that theory, but that's what it's supposed to be like. This is what it's supposed to look like. Clear separation of left-handers from right-handers. Blah, 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 blah. This is what my data looks like all over the map. There's no clear separation on which hemisphere is dominant for which task for my left and right-handers. There's no way to predict that visual spatial attention will be in the opposite hemisphere as language, which is supposed to happen. Stone tool making imaging is like the wild west of the whole wide world. We don't even know where napping is in the brain. Some people say right hemisphere, some people say left. There's this whole theory of language evolution. We don't even know. That data is also ugly so far in my sample. It's just like things are going everywhere. And depending on which handedness measure you use, it's basically like right-handers do seem to have like more propensity to be the perfect system of amazingness that we expect, and left-handers are not. But generally, that's my timer. Um, bloop. Okay, but generally, like if you look at any of the tasks, even using the more naturalistic tasks, left-handers and right-handers are overlapping in their handed behavior. They're overlapping in which hemispheres are dominant for these tasks. They're overlapping in just pretty much everything, and the system is incredibly noisy. So, I can't remember what happens next. Oh, I have a, two little vignettes, if that's okay. Um, this person, um, you can't really see the red on the screen, but this person um, is a reported right-hander, has a very, very positive right-handed survey score, came in and used his left hand for most of the puzzle task, came in and had a left bias grip strength score, came in and had a left bias pegboard talent score, came in and had like familial left-handedness. His father and sister are left-handed. So, And then you go and you look at his brain, and his brain is a traditional right-hander type brain. He didn't actually have any language laterality. It was bilateral, both hemispheres active. And then visual, spatial, and napping skills were both lateralized to the right hemisphere. Curious little guy there. Um, left-hander, self-reported, had a really negative left-handed score, um, came in and was... Sorry, I have some interesting things here. Sorry, came in here and had like really, really mixed handedness measures. Um, so was left biased for pegboard and finger tapping, was right biased for the puzzle all over the map. And then he had left hemisphere dominant language, right hemisphere dominant visual spatial skills, and uh, left hemisphere dominant napping, which is like that's textbook brain activation for a right hander. And he's a self reported left hander who had mixed handedness scores. So this is the type of data that I'm collecting. I've only collected less than half of it. Who knows how my stats are gonna work out. When I reported this talk, I was like, oh man, my dissertation is really scary looking right now. Um, <laughs> I don't have a whole lot of happy stories to tell, but I do wanna finish with like, this is the type of work that I think needs to be done. A lot of our field is based on like very wibbly proxy behavior type theories, and they're beautiful, I love them. Um, but for people like me, I want to like give pragmatic credence or like give some pragmatic non-credence so that we can narrow which theories need to be evaluated and which ones need to be given more space and things like that. And I love being an interdisciplinary researcher because I can come from one field and critique another. And then in that space where everything overlaps and things actually work out, that's the space that we should continue to like investigate. So it's a fascinating field. I love all of what you talked about. Sorry not to talk about theory, but I'm happy to talk about it if you want to. Um, 
And then I just want to finish by thanking my collaborators and all the people who have helped me figure out how to do this research. Girls Who Code, it's very difficult to join neuroscience from an archaeological perspective, um, but it's been really fun. So. <laughs>